Hey friends, welcome to the YouTube channel All About Electronics. So in this video, we will learn about the BCD Ripple counter and the Modify counter. And in general, we will see that how we can design the Ripple counter of the any modulus. Apart from that, we will also see that how the Ripple counter acts as a frequency divider. So in the previous video, we have seen the 2-bit, 3-bit and the 4-bit Ripple counters. So all the counters which we have discussed were the full modulus counter. Meaning that the modulus of these counters is equal to 2 to the power n, where the n is the number of flip-flops in the counter. For example, if we see this 4-bit Ripple counter, then it counts from 0 to 15. Or we can say that its modulus is equal to 2 to the power 4. Similarly, this 3-bit counter counts from 0 to 7. Or we can say that its modulus is equal to 2 to the power 3. That means all these counters are the full modulus counters. But sometimes we also need to design the counter which counts up to the specific value. For example, let's say we want to design a counter which counts from 0 to 4. Or in the binary, it counts from 000 to 100. So basically, it is the modify counter. So by using the binary ripple counter along with some additional logic circuit, it is possible to design such ripple counters. So while designing this counter, the output of the binary ripple counter is given to the combinational circuit. And the output of the combinational circuit is connected to the clear input of the ripple counter. So while designing these counters, the first step is to find the required number of flip-flops. So we know that if we have a n-bit counter, then the maximum possible output state is equal to 2 to the power n. So if capital N is the total number of output states of the counter, then it should satisfy this condition. So in this case, the total number of output states is equal to 5. So from this equation, the minimum required number of flip-flops is equal to 3. That means to design this mod 5 counter, we require the 3 number of flip-flops. So once we find the required number of flip-flops, then the second step is to find the combinational circuit. So in general, in the second step, the output of each flip-flop is given to the combinational circuit and the output of the combinational circuit is connected to the clear input of the each flip-flop. So here we are assuming that the clear input is the active low input. Meaning that when this signal is low, then it will reset all the flip-flops to the zero. So assuming the up counter, this 3-bit counter will count from 0 to 7. But here, we need to design this combinational circuit in a such a way that it generates the clear signal when the output count goes beyond the 100. And in this way, when the count goes beyond the 100, then this combinational circuit resets the counter to the 000. So in this way, this counter counts from 000 to 100. So now, let us see how to design this combinational circuit. So like I said earlier, this clear input is the active low input. So here, up to the count 100, the output of this combinational circuit should remain 1. And as soon as the count goes to 101, then it should generate the clear signal. That means for this 101 combination, the output of this logic circuit should become 0. So here, these remaining two combinations are the don't care terms. So with the help of the K-map, let us try to find the simplified expression. So here, since we have only one zero term, so let us try to combine that with the don't care terms. So here, the min term M5 is equal to zero, while the min term M6 and the M7 are the don't care terms. So here, we can combine this min term M5 with the M7. So here, this group corresponds to Q2 dot Q0. So here, since we are comparing the zeros, so we can say that this R dash is equal to Q2 dot Q0. Or in other words, this R is equal to this Q2 dot Q0 whole bar. So basically, we can implement this function with the help of the NAND gate. And for that, we need to apply the Q2 and the Q0 input to the NAND gate. And the output of the NAND gate should be applied to the clear input. So whenever the count goes to 101, then the output of this NAND gate will become 0 and it will reset all the flip-flops to the 0. That means in that case, the counter will get reset to 0. So typically, 
using the NAND gate in the feedback, it is possible to reset the counter at the specific count. So let us also see the same thing in the timing diagram. So here, starting from the 000, the counter will start counting and it will count up to the 100. And then momentarily, the count will go to the 101. So as soon as the count goes to 101, then the NAND gate will generate the clear signal. And in this way, it will reset the counter to the 000. So this time depends on the propagation delay of the NAND gate. So now let me also show you the same thing in the simulation. So here the same circuit is implemented using the three positive AC card D flip flops and the NAND gate. So as you can see over here, the D flip flops are used in the toggle mode and the Q0 and the Q2 outputs are connected to the NAND gate. So, so far during our discussion, we have assumed that initially the counter starts from the zero. But actually, when we just turn on the counter, then the output state of the each flip flop is not known. So, to start the counting from the zero, initially we need to clear all the flip flops to the zero. And to do that, here this additional circuit is used. So, here this clear input is applied through the multiplexer. So, initially, when the selection input is zero, then the clear input will get selected and it will reset all the flip-flops in the counter. And once the all flip-flops gets reset, then we will make this selection input to the logic one. So as soon as we make this selection input to the logic one, then the output of the NAND gate will be applied to the clear inputs of the each flip-flop. And now this circuit will work as per our requirement. So now let me run the simulation and let me show you the output. So initially, since the select input is equal to zero, so this clear input will reset all the flip-flops to the zero. So once all the flip-flops gets reset to zero, we will make the selection input to the logic one. So now the output of the counter will go from 000 to 100. So let me also show you the same thing in the timing diagram. So as I said earlier, Initially to reset all the flip-flops, this clear input and the select input is made logic 0. And once all the flip-flops get reset to 0, both the inputs are made logic 1. So let me just run the simulation and let me show you the output waveform. So as you can see, after the count 100, momentarily the output goes to 101. And as soon as the count goes to 101, this NAND gate will generate the logic 0 and it will clear all the flip-flops. And hence, once again, the output of the counter will become 000. So that is the simulation of the modify counter. So similarly, we can also design the BCD ripple counter, which is also known as the mod 10 counter. So while designing this counter, the first thing that we need to find is the required number of flip-flops. So as we have seen earlier, in this case, the modulus n is equal to 10. That means here, to satisfy this equation, the minimum required number of flip-flops is equal to 4. That means we need the 4 flip-flops for designing this BCD counter. So here, with the help of the 4 positive waste trigger JK flip-flops, the binary up counter has been designed. That means it will count from 0000 to 1111. And now, we need to select the commercial circuit in a such a way that this counter counts from 0000 to 1001. And when the counts goes beyond that, then it will get reset to 0000. So once again, up to this 1001 count, the output of this commercial circuit should remain 1. And when the count goes to 1010, then it should generate the logic 0 for the clear inputs. So once again, here we are assuming that the clear input is the active low input. That means for the 1010 count, the output of this commercial circuit should become 0. So here, these remaining 5 input combinations are the don't care terms. So like we have seen for the modify counter, we can use the NAND gate in the feedback to generate this clear signal. So here, to generate this clear signal, this Q3 should be equal to 1, while the Q2 should be equal to 0. And likewise, this Q1 and Q0 should be equal to 1 and 0. That means here, to generate this clear input, we can connect the Q3, Q1 
as well as the Q2 bar and the Q0 bar output of the flip flop to the NAND gate. So once we connect that input combination, then up to 1001, the output of the NAND gate will remain 1. And whenever the input count goes to 1010, then the output of the NAND gate will become 0. And in this way, it will reset all the flip flops. So in this way, by connecting these four inputs to the NAND gate, we can reset the counter to the 0 whenever the count goes beyond the 1001. But if you closely observe over here, then there is no need to apply all four inputs. And in fact, if we just connect the Q3 and Q1 to the NAND gate, then also this circuit will work. Because before this 1010, both Q3 and Q1 are not one at the same time. That means up to 1001, the output of this NAND gate will remain 1. And whenever the count goes to 1010, then both Q3 and Q1 will become 1. And in this way, this NAND gate will generate the logic 0 for the clear inputs. That means just by connecting the Q3 and Q1 output to the NAND gates, we can get our desired output sequence. And the same thing can also be seen with the help of the K-map. So for that, here let us combine the zeros in the K-map with the don't care terms. So here, this mean term M10 is equal to 0, while the M11 to M15 are the don't care terms. So here, we can combine this mean term M10 with the three don't care terms that is M11, M14 and the M15. So this group corresponds to Q3 dot Q1. So here, since we are combining the zeros, so we can say that this R dash is equal to Q3 dot Q1. Or we can say that the R is equal to Q3 dot Q1 whole bar. So this function can be implemented with the help of the NAND gate. So with the help of the KMAP also, we got the same result. So this is the circuit of the BCD ripple counter. And as you can see, the Q3 and the Q1 outputs are connected to the NAND gate and the output of the NAND gate is connected to the clear input. So with this circuit, this counter will count from 0000 to 1001. So now let me also show you the simulation result for the BCD counter. So here, using the positive H triggered D flip flops, the BCD counter has been implemented. So as I said earlier, the initial state of the flip flops are not known. So they have been cleared with the help of the clear input. And this signal is applied to the multiplexer. So initially, when the select input is equal to 0, then all the flip-flops will get reset to 0. And then, when the selection input is made 1, then the output of the NAND gate will get connected to the clear input of the all flip-flops. And now, the counter will count from 0000 to 1001. So now, let me just run the simulation and let me show you the timing diagram. So like I said earlier, Initially to reset all the flip-flops to the zero, momentarily, this clear input and the selection inputs are made zero, and then after they are made logic one. So if I just run the simulation, then this is how the output waveforms will look like. So as you can see, initially, the counter starts from 0000, and then it goes up to the 1001. And after that, momentarily, the count will go to the 1010 and then after it will become 0. So basically, as soon as the count becomes 1010, then the output of the NAND gate will become 0 and it will reset all the flip flops. So this time depends on the propagation delay of the NAND gate. So over here, this one clock duration is equal to 200 nanosecond. So this time will be around 20 nanosecond which is typically propagation delay of the 74 series gates. So if your frequency is in kilohertz, then perhaps you won't even notice this glitch in the timing diagram. But while decoding the output of the counter, we can make sure that these little transients will not be captured by the decoder circuit. So let us see how it is being done. Now typically, the output of the counter can be decoded with the help of the standard decoder. So in this case, I have used this 4 to 16 decoder. Now generally, the decoder circuit also has the enable input. So in this case, this enable input is the active high. So to remove these transients, what we can do? We can apply the inverted clock signal to the enable input of the decoder. That means whenever 
this clock signal goes low then and then only the decoder will get enabled or in other words at the every falling edge of the clock pulse the decoder will get enabled so here we are also assuming that the duty cycle of the clock pulse is equal to 50% that means here once we apply the clock signal then the decoder will get enabled after the delay of the half clock period and by that time if there is any transient in the circuit then it will not get picked up by the decoder moreover until the next rising gauge the output of the counter will not change so in this way the decoder can easily decode the output of the counter without picking up any glitches so such method is known as the strobing and with the help of the strobing we can avoid any glitches during the decoding so now let me also show you the same thing with the help of the timing diagram of this decoder so as you can see over here from q0 to q3 are connected to the a0 to a3 inputs of the decoder and here from y0 to y10 outputs of the decoder have been observed so now let me show you the timing diagram of the decoder so initially to reset all the flip flops the selection and the clear inputs have been made zero and then after they are connected to the logic one so as you can see at the every falling gauge the output of the decoder changes from y0 to y9 so after y9 the output of the counter will momentarily go to the 1010 but it will not get detected by the decoder because if you see over here then the y10 output remains zero because as you can see the decoder gets enabled at the falling gauge of the clock so here by the time the decoder receives the falling gauge of the clock the transients already have been settled and the output of the counter has been already reset to the zero that means this transient will not get detected by the decoder so that is the usual technique which is used for the decoding the output of the counter so that is all regarding the bcd ripple counter and in this way we can design the ripple counter of the any modulus so now let us see how the ripple counter acts as a frequency divider and to understand that let us take the two bit ripple counter and first let us see its timing diagram so let's say the time period of the clock signal is equal to t so if we see its frequency then its frequency f will be equal to 1 by t on the other end if you see the output q0 then the time period of this q0 output is equal to 2t so we can say that its frequency is equal to f divided by 2 and likewise if you see the time period of the q1 then that is equal to 4t so we can say that its frequency is equal to f divided by 4 that means if we see any two bit counter then if f is the input clock frequency then its output clock frequency is equal to f divided by 4 so basically if we take the output from the msb position of the counter then at the output the input frequency will get divided by the factor of n where the n is the modulus of the counter so in this case since it is the two bit counter so its modulus is equal to 4 that means here the output frequency will get divided by the 4 similarly if we take the three bit ripple counter then if f is the clock frequency of the input signal then its output frequency will be equal to f divided by 8 because for this 3 bit ripple counter its modulus is equal to 8 and likewise if we take the bcd counter then its output frequency will be equal to f divided by 10 so you can also verify the same thing by looking at the earlier output waveform of the bcd counter so if you see this q3 output then it is getting repeated after the 10 clock cycles that means if f is the frequency of the input clock signal then the output frequency of this output q3 is equal to f divided by 10 similarly if we have a mod 20 counter then if f is the frequency of the input clock signal then the output frequency will be equal to f divided by 20 so in general if f is the frequency of the input clock signal to the counter then its output frequency is equal to f divided by n where the n is the modulus of the counter so in this way we can use the ripple counter as the frequency divider moreover we can also increase the modulus of the counter by cascading the multiple such counters of the different modulus for example 
If we want to design the mod 20 counter, then we can do so by cascading the mod 5 counter and the mod 4 counters. So in this case also, if f is the input frequency of the clock signal, then the output frequency of the cascaded system will be equal to f divided by 20. So in general, if we cascade mod m and the mod n counters together, then the overall modulus of the counter will be equal to mod mn. And even if we interchange the position of the two counters, then also we will get the same result. That means if we connect the mod 4 counter first and then the mod 5 counter, then also we will get the mod 20 counter. And in this case also, the output frequency will be equal to f divided by 20. But in this case, the duty cycle of the output waveform can be different from the previous case. Not only that, depending on the order in which these counters are connected, we will also get the different output sequence. For example, the output sequence in case of the mod 5 followed by the mod 4 counter will be different from the output sequence of the mod 4 counter followed by the mod 5 counter. So with the help of the simulation, let us see the results and let us understand this point. So in the first case, this mod 20 counter is designed by cascading the mod 4 counter followed by the mod 5 counter. So as you can see, this is the mod 4 counter and this is the mod 5 counter. And both the counters are designed using the negative way triggered D flip flops. So here, this Q0 and Q1 are the outputs of the mod 4 counter while the Q2, Q3 and Q4 are the outputs of the mod 5 counter. So here, the output of the mod 4 counter that is Q1 is connected to the clock input of the mod 5 counter. And once again, to clear all the flip flops initially, the clear signal is applied using the multiplexer. And then the selection input is made 1. So now let me run the simulation and let me show you the output waveform of the counter. So here the select input is initially made 0 and then it is made logic 1. So as you can see up to 20 clock cycles, the reset input remains 1. And at the negative edge of the 20th clock cycle, the reset input becomes 0. And once it becomes 0, then it clears this mod 20 counter. That means after that, all the flip flops will start from the 0. And the counter will get reset to 0000. So here, if we see the output waveform of the Q4, then it repeats after the 20 clock pulses. That means the frequency of the Q4 output is equal to F divided by 20. But here, the duty cycle of the waveform is less than 50%. So in this case, if you see the output sequence, then it is following the binary number sequence. That means here, the output of the counter is changing from 00000 to 10011. Similarly, let us try to implement the same mod 20 counter using the mod 5 counter followed by the mod 4 counter. So here, all the counters were implemented using the negative way triggered D flip flops. So this is the mod 5 counter while this is the mod 4 counter. So as you can see, the output of the mod 5 counter is connected to the clock input of the mod 4 counter. And once again, with the help of the multiplexer, initially, all the flip flops have been reset to 0. So now, let us see the output waveform of this counter. So as you can see, this mod 5 counter gets reset after the every fifth clock cycle. So that is why we are seeing this little glitch after the every fifth clock cycle. But like I said earlier, with the help of the strobing, we can avoid these glitches during the decoding. So here, this Q4 is the overall output of this mod 20 counter. So if we see its time period, then it is getting repeated after the every 20th clock cycle. That means from here to here, the time period is equal to 20 clock cycles. Or we can say that the frequency of the output waveform is equal to F divided by 20. And here as you can see, the duty cycle of the output waveform is equal to 50%. That means that depending on the order in which these counters are cascaded, we can have the different duty cycles at the output. Moreover, in this case, the output sequence is also different from the previous case. So in this case, if you see, then the output is not following the binary number sequence. That means although it is the mod 20 counter, 
but its output sequence is different from the other mod counter which we have designed with the help of the mod4 counter followed by the mod5 counter. But in both the cases, the output frequency is equal to f divided by 20. So in this way, by cascading the multiple ripple counters together, we can design the counter of the higher modulus. And in this way, we can use the ripple counter for the frequency division. So if you have any questions or suggestions, then do let me know here in the comment section below. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more such videos.